sorry. <laughs> Which means we must be live. Just waiting for it to redirect us to the correct page. And then Harry will tell me if he's in there and we're on time. Sorry, just finding it. I say definitely needs some interlude music. I know Academy is live. Where are we? Here we are. Don't want to hear past us. Okay, so like I said, we'll just sit here for a moment while the room fills up. Let's call it a room. I think people are quite interested in this one. Okay. Um, a few shares of the event itself. Uh -huh. Okay, is that, sorry, is that Sai in the comments section? Because that picture is really not a great thumbnail. I'm a very, very visual thinker um, and it's a really unpleasant thumbnail. Um, I'd say silliness. Anyway, hello people, we will do proper introductions in a moment, just waiting for the room to fill up. So I've got Harry, what kind of potato do you call this? Because um, I'm Dr. Potato. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, so Ginny saying really interesting today's topic. Lovely. Uh, I'm excited for today. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So people are quite interested in this topic. I may talk about a potato. Any particular reason? Uh, well, I'll keep you in suspense on that one. Okay. <laughs> so letting people in. 20 odd people. That's nice. That That's enough people for me to do introductions at least. Um, so hello, everybody. And if you are new to Academy, we are an educative platform um, where all our educators are from all sorts of backgrounds, but they are all neurodivergent. So we do not have neurotypical people on our show. Um, and today I am joined by Lisa Cromar. Hello, Lisa. Hello. Thanks for having me. Um, it's lovely that people come on. It's great. Um, and today we are going to largely be discussing Lisa's chapter, or at least the um, the point of your chapter which was in the neurodiversity reader on um, is person-centered counseling effective for autistic people so let's say just a couple more minutes well not not a couple more minutes maybe a minute because it's filling up nicely hello everybody and there's a bit of a lag as well on um facebook's about 20 seconds behind Harry having a joke. Um, I never knew you were a visual thinker. He does. He tries very hard, actually, um, not to say things that might set my visual thinking off and make me really horrified. Hello, everybody. Everyone's popping in. Okay. Oh, lovely group. Lovely group. Um, okay. So we've got um, some, some nice, straightforward, hopefully, questions to guide our discussion today. Um, I'm quite um, interested in this one myself. So what I quite like, Lisa, is that you've, well, it's obviously your background as well is interest in person-centered counseling. Um, and I recently, I, th I think we discussed this before um, uh, when we were discussed you coming on, which is I now have training that I deliver, which is about the efficacy and effectiveness of CBT for autistic people um, and well-being things. And so reading through your um, chapter, which I said today, it's really good that we have guests coming on from the Neurodiversity Reader, which I have and I'm in because it means I read their chapters. Otherwise, you just don't get around to it. And it's such a lovely book, it even is. just like the actual picture on it is just a beautiful book. Yeah. Um, Oh no, train of thought. I've lost it. Went off on a tangent. So what happens, isn't it? Um, so yeah, so, so I'm particularly interested because you're coming it from the person um, centered counseling perspective and I'm coming from, well, I don't do CBT, but I looked at that perspective um, in terms of well-being of autistic people. Um, so we tend to start with a quite straightforward question that doesn't really have 
that much necessarily to do with the topic you want to discuss today, which is when did you discover you were autistic? I discovered um, a few years ago when I was 37 years old um, that I was autistic and it came about because my then 10 year old son um, we started looking into autism for him. Um, in his earlier years, he was on the ADHD pathway, but as he got older, that kind of, he didn't appear kind of as ADHD, it, it looked like something else. And as I was kind of, as I'm a researcher, <laughs> um, just by nature, um, I, I started reading up about that. Um, and I then got onto the subject of females, autistic females, and it was just like, how has this person just described who I am? <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd, I'd spent most of my life thinking I was, um, you know, I didn't really fit in and nothing really explained me. So then seeing this thing written out that was, wow, that's me. <laughs> I was like, was oh. In particular? Um, oh, it was quite random things. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me think of something. Um, so like as a, as a child, I... I got quite distressed if, if I had to wear dresses um, and it, it kind of was it wasn't just a, a personal like thing it was a you know I, I, I ran in front of a car and get hit by a car when my mum made me wear a dress it was really quite distressing it was just a bit unusual the behavior was quite unusual there um, and apparently it's because I didn't like the feel of the dresses on my knees so this is the kind of stuff I probably hadn't told anybody. Another thing that stood out for me was um, it, as, a, as quite a young child, um, but probably under 10, I, I'd kind of say in my head, oh, that's how the girls do it. That's how they know how to do that. Um, and, and I'd kind of be constantly mimicking to, to know how to be a little girl. <laughs> so I just didn't quite fit in right. Um, so when I started to read things it was like well that kind of triggered those sorts of memories in me where I wasn't really getting it or or, or it was unusual um, and I'm just wondering what did you see or read that that also because you said you were reading it and you're like how is this person this this describing me mm. do you remember any of the um you saw or read I can't remember off the top of my head it's okay. just it was like just seeing a list and I I, I probably ticked absolutely everything on it's just yeah. where you're saying the list it's it's it, i kind of something similar i guess which is i just started to see more um female or basically non uh, more masked representations um, yeah because it doesn't really help to to gender it either but no, no i agree um yeah but we're still but personally i am yes i'm female so it was yeah. useful to see other people with similar um presentation um and so I started to sort of twig, but I remember sitting in the GP's office, literally about to walk in and say, can I have an assessment? And I found um, Samantha Crafts. Um, oh, yes. I share that all the time because yeah. that's, it's that I'm talking about. It's it's that. <laughs> I, and that's what I wondered because you said it yeah. was and you were like, this is me. And that's yeah. how I felt in the GP's um, yeah. um, waiting room. And it actually, I was quite tearful, but because I felt seen for, a, mm. you know, I was like, this is me. So no, it was just the way you said that was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, I agree about the gender thing. I mean, I, I know males um, or, or non-gender, uh, non-binary people, you know, it's not about gender, but for, obviously in my own self-discovery, yeah. that's what happened. It, it kind of stood out more for me when I found like you say that that list that not list you know the article you know yeah. the one, that well, one. I mean the Samantha Craft one is a great list and and although she wrote it initially as a female autistics list um I sort of well I worded it um we, we kind of turned it into questions that you could answer uh, for yourself yeah and we degendered it so that it could actually be used because the students that I typically support who are autistic are um, all sorts of genders yeah but they're masked which is basically what really we're talking about when we're talking about yeah this idea of female autism completely agree with that yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Sorry. almost it's all, <laughs> it's almost like it needs a different name because at the moment I think it's very much categorized into male traits female yeah. traits and we kind of tr we almost trip into that we fall into that it's like well no it's it's not it's, that can discriminate against genders because they might see that listen it, it counts for them but they're not typically female it's um yeah it needs 
it needs something else. <laughs> Annette Foster and I really need to write our paper on something that we presented several times and theorised and spent lots of time and energy over. Mm. But the idea of trying to publish is just exhausting in and of itself. Oh my goodness, um, tell me about the publishing. I am having a nightmare in that process right now. We theorised about how to degender by talking about internal and external experiences of being autistic so basically whether they're observable experiences is what we would class as the stereotypical male autism which it's not it's just a um, a much more observably autistic uh-huh. expression and then the internal more masked presentation um, so yeah we talk about it internal external to try and remove the gender but everyone's a bit of both as well so it gets really yeah. anyway that's a whole other talk <laughs> yeah. that's a but whole you need other... you need to write that paper i need to i need I to know. read that <laughs> well you can see, you can see our poster and stuff on it if you like yeah, but, yeah i'd love to yeah presentation on it it's how i met harry actually because oh well yeah. um anyway no not about me right so um what is your background okay so um I, my, my like going way back there background to my like previous life, um, I came from quite a corporate background. Um, but why I did that, I do not know. I must have been living in hell trying to live that life, you know, so busy and customer facing. And um, I think it was very high energy. And I didn't really realize that at the time because that was pre knowing I'm autistic. Uh, I then had my first child and then went on to have two other children so I kind of left that world and once I had my third child Lewis uh, he's nearly seven um, I thought well whilst he was kind of a toddler what could I study that by the time he starts school I can go and do a job that I'm actually going to enjoy rather than having to go to this other job that I wouldn't particularly enjoy and I had a bit of an epiphany um, driving one day I was like I think I should I would enjoy being a counsellor <laughs> um so I looked into that and, and stumbled across like a a beginner's sort of course quite, quite local to me um so that's how that happened I did that course then I did another small course that led to the degree but in that process I that's when I found out I was autistic so just before starting my degree i like a couple of months found out I was autistic so one of the first things I said when I met this group of you know budding counsellors was I'm autistic and I'd not even told you know a lot of my external you know the more external type family yet but that group of strangers I decided I should tell Um, it's easier to tell strangers yeah Yeah. I think so but I kind of wanted them to know as we were about because now a counselling course you really have to um well you know you it goes right down to your core and your soul really um you know you have to be able to talk about anything in counselor training just in case you come across a client who needs to talk about that you've got to make sure that it's not going to trigger you so you have to and you have to commit to not hiding anything <laughs> so i guess i wanted in that room to let them know this was a major part of me and also i wanted them to know that if i came across in a way i didn't intend to come across so say they were reading my expressions wrongly because a lot of the time i i just my face doesn't really isn't very animated um but people can read that wrongly they might read that that i'm grumpy or um or uninterested um so i wanted to say look if, if my face is telling you something negative can you please ask me rather than assume something from what my face is doing because I didn't want this whole group to not accept me and it was really important to me to feel accepted in that in that room um, and not have that kind of anxiety that they might be reading me wrongly they may not have but it was my own anxiety that I wanted to put that out there but I I I feel that I um, always had that issue as, as how people seen me the masked me and the very neutral autistic face that I have and I think I've, I've mentioned this before on different um, talks that we've done where zoom sadly is making me smile more <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I realized from doing early interviews this way uh. that I don't look like I'm interested and yeah. To some extent, that's frustrating. I shouldn't have to sort of make myself smile because I'm talking to another autistic person. So I, you know, hopefully they would understand that I am interested. My way of being interested is making notes and asking questions. Yeah. Um, but to some extent, I also still, you can't help it because you can see yourself and you're like, oh, exactly. Chloe, you don't look interested. 
need to look yeah. interested yeah um, which is really frustrating because it makes my face hurt because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the time when you're doing counselor training as well you have to be filmed doing it um not real clients i mean with each other um and you have to like self um analyze yourself and body language obviously you have to analyze your own body language and your tutor will analyze your body language and one of the ones for me was always my face <laughs> um and i always tried um but that was like uh consistently through the the course was the thing i needed to work on um because I, you know obviously i'm going to, i'm counseling people i'm not always a counseling autistic people who might get that a bit more you know i need to be able to make sure my face is representing and does look friendly and, and that kind of thing so it's although kind of in my personal life I'm, I'm a big advocate of accepting us and seeing our body language the way it is rather than trying to make us neurotypical as a counsellor I, I obviously have to step back from that um, and be prepared to that must help be quite difficult it takes again it, it's, it's an element of concentration that mm. maybe another counsellor might not have to take into consideration I must um, take it out on you though mm. because not only are you doing something that makes non-autistic potentially neurotypical i wonder how many neurotypical people go into things like counseling i'm not sure um but you know it's already an exhausting emotionally exhausting and cognitively exhausting thing to do which is to work with other people who are in distress mm -hmm. so i just i wonder if it takes that more out of you because you're also having to remind your face to do things yeah you know absolutely and to be honest um you know vast percentage of my clients are autistic so it's not like every client I have to think about that about not so much you know I'm obviously I obviously need to make my autistic clients know also that I'm friendly but it, it doesn't feel as important <laughs> do you know what I mean um we just seem to be more like there seems to we just seem to click really well and there isn't as much concentration there so I'd say from my point of view actually for me counseling a neurotypical person would probably be harder than an autistic person whereas a you know neurotypical counselor would probably obviously put that the other way around um just because there's that natural connection that's there more quickly and more easily uh, just you know one of the same tribe kind of thing um i'm gonna make a note about that anyway because it's not something we've popped on here but mm. you know i made loads of notes which i'm not going to go through anyway while i was reading your chapter because i was like yes and this and oh <laughs> yes you know because it's it's like i say it's my interest is mental health yeah. um although not as a therapist um mm -hmm. in in the way that you are um so yeah basically how we need more therapists more therapists um who specialize in um, particular neurotype uh -huh. because they are that neurotype <clears throat> means they arguably would be better able to support yeah there's that i mean with any person you come into contact with um, in counseling there'll be some that, that you gel with quickly some you won't gel with at all you know that it's it's like a relationship um, and some of the relationships fit and some don't you know with every counselor and with every client it's got to be the right fit um, so, you know, my, my, my personal counsellor isn't autistic, but she has autistic experience, personal and professional. And she's, you know, she's absolutely fine. It's, we have a relationship there, but she knows how to communicate with me um, and is very positive about the autistic side of me because she's done, she's gone to the trouble of finding out about it. So um, I don't know if it, it, it helps. It certainly helps to be autistic to counsel an autistic client because of that more natural bond that, that happens more quickly, but it's not essential, um, I would say. Um, but going back to the, um, like the energy side of this and being autistic and a counselor, for me, I, I probably wouldn't work any more than two or three days a week because and is that in comparison to non-autistic people is that well I mean a lot of counselors will be working five days a week yeah. and they'll have maybe 20 clients I think the average clients group you'd have about 20 maximum so you sort of see maybe four a day I have this calculus so that might not be right <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm really not good at maths either, and I've done advanced statistics. So. Well, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I am very aware 
that I get tired more quickly and I won't therefore work more than that. I mean, I'm doing a PhD at the moment as well. So if I work, uh, so I only do two days um, maximum, which is basically eight clients. So for another counselor, that would probably not sound a lot, but for me, that's enough. Um, so yeah, that's how I conserve that energy. But if I wasn't doing a PhD, I probably still would only do three days at, at a maximum. It's still on the background bit because you haven't mentioned the PhD yet, other than literally just mentioning it, but you haven't discussed it. Okay. So, wait, so you did the count, so you went or started um, counseling training. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, background. Sorry. Um, oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, yes, yeah, I found it, the journeys coincided with each other because so as a counselor you're kind of you find out all about yourself it's a, it's a self journey person centered counseling especially because it's a relationship that is as much about the counselor as it is the client so you have to go through everything yourself it's a very very personal journey to go through i i, I, I think everybody should do it because you learn so much about yourself um but obviously the person I was finding out about was an autistic self that I'd only just discovered, but actually makes up all of me, which, you know, where, where you kind of, I know I, and I'm, I know many other people kind of experience this, um, it's sort of in stages, don't we? It's like that denial stage, the getting a bit angry state, <laughs> um, and, a, 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 you know, confusion sort of stage, the will these people who I've been trying to impress all these years now think less of me? I'm going to be a professional in the counselling field. Will people think I'm up to it if they know I'm autistic? And, you know, that sort of almost coming out and that working up to coming out to various different groups and people. Um, so that was my counselling journey. The very first essay I did was a seminar and it was about um, or being autistic. And actually, the training that I deliver now, which, you know, I, I've done with the BACP <laughs> most recently, the British Association of Counselors and Psychotherapists, is evolved from that very first essay that I did on my counselling course, which is insane, really. I got a first for that, that essay. I'd not done any kind of higher education before, and I didn't get particularly good GCSEs, but this subject was so important to me I was so passionate about it especially as someone who has had counselling and it's sort of failed because I've been constantly with counsellors who haven't understood that I'm autistic well, I didn't know I was autistic either but that was my experience that really those counsellors maybe should have spotted it um I, I had one counsellor who um kind of it was on the NHS so it's like you only have six sessions which is just a nightmare but I kind of got to maybe week three and it's like you do know you're only going to get six sessions don't you <laughs> because I wasn't being fast enough I wasn't really connected to my feelings quickly enough yeah. I since it found out too long for us yeah yeah um I've since found out you know I've I, I've got alexithymia and I, I do struggle with that and that was on counselor training was really quite difficult because we were expected to say what we were feeling so like, sometimes I don't know what I'm feeling I know I'm feeling but what that is I don't know I mean I found through my counselor a way around that now um and I am then better able to connect to those feelings but it wasn't natural you know um so that was the counseling course um now, I wrote this literature review as the final essay in that on that course. So, and my life has just gone crazy since then. <laughs> so, um, I, um, I, I kind of, it's been shared quite a lot um, when I just put it out on um, uh, ac academia. It is academia, isn't it? Yes, I mean, so, yeah. <laughs> um, academy doesn't mean anything. I can't even say it anymore because we're so used to saying academy. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I, it was first published in a, a magazine for the the person centred quarterly, um, and so then I shared it. It went worldwide. Then um, it's been shared about three thousand times um, around the world. It was. I mean. I ha I, I'm new to this, so that I know that's probably not that exciting to to many people. But for me, for doing this college essay, basically, and it was being shared in all these countries, it was just super exciting. Uh, but this started to get picked up by other people. 
and somebody wrote to me um, and said, I've read your literature review that she was on a, a PhD student um, and her PhD supervisor had sent it to her to say, look at this literature review because she was studying something you know, to do with autism. Um, and she said, have you thought about doing a PhD yourself? Um, and I had thought about it, but not for as soon as I left my degree. Um, but it kind of got me thinking, oh, maybe, no, maybe because I was felt like I was kind of riding high on this literature review, maybe that was the right time to do it. And a lot of people were interested in my opinion on, on counselling and autism. It felt like I needed to do it then. So um, that's what happened. And that's nearly a year ago since I started the PhD. So what's um, the, the main aim for your PhD? What's the, the fundamental research questions? I guess. It's, it, it's Sorry, this is not your viva. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, so it's looking at what does and doesn't work uh, in counselling for autistic people, basically. So it's actually asking autistic people, well, what, 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 what have you found useful? What's really not being useful? And trying to um, trying to understand that better. So what I would hope at the end of that is that I have you know, a model or, or, or a creation that, that can then be put into counsellor training, because uh, that's what doesn't really exist right now. You, you have people like me um, who are who are counsellors who, well, for me, I deliver some PA, uh, some uh, CPD, continuous professional development, to other counsellors. And there's other people like me who are going around delivering that kind of CPD, but there's no consistency there with that. Um, and it's on the counsellor to decide whether they do or don't do that particular CPD. And what you find is um, the, the counsellors that do choose to do that have an interest in autism anyway. Um, and so that's frustrating because mm. we, we the, the Griffiths paper from, when was it, was it 2019, um, that demonstrates we're more likely to experience traumatic events and then our, the correlation between that and us also having greater rates of mental health concerns compared to a neurotypical um, control or comparison condition, um, we're more likely to need therapy. Absolutely. But it but then we get turned away because we're autistic and they think they don't know what to do with us. Well, to some extent that is true. Yeah. Um, or they conflate autistic experience for mental health and mental mm -hmm. health for autistic experience. And competing, yeah. I've mentioned this before, which is, um, you know, our sting behaviors which are repetitive patterns of behavior they conflate those for ocd mm -hmm. um or not to say that autistic people don't experience ocd mm -hmm. but they are different things yes um burnout for depression exactly we talked about that last time didn't we um you know most of the time in my own life experience i now recognize that it's not necessarily bouts of depression i've had it's bouts of burnout yes. and so it's not necessarily it's not necessarily the case that i need to maybe looking counselling at going back to some traumatic events that I need to work through to be happy again actually it's I need to watch my energy levels take yeah. a bit of a break and come back again it's so so I think GPs are having autistic people come in saying oh that's depression here's some tablets and not understanding that difference um yeah I, I mean in, in the literature review I've done I, I've got some comparison charts on that on that comparing certain conditions or behaviors between autistic people and neurotypical people and depression 70 percent in autistic people compared to 12 percent in neurotypical people that although it will be higher because of everything that that we go through this still feels a bit too high yeah and i would argue the same that it's yeah. more likely can we need to start seeing more work on picking apart what is autistic experience and what is a mental health concern because the person's experiencing trauma yeah. and 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 it's the same the same experience i have experienced um bouts of depression mm -hmm. but but there were definitely periods where i would describe myself as an optimistic depressed person in my 20s because there was no hopelessness which is yeah. fundamental to experiencing depression yeah um and so i looking back i'm like no they were just extreme burnout periods yeah. Um, and if only we so then it becomes about well if we know the differences if it's mm -hmm. depression then you need certain something from a therapist mm -hmm. you could still go potentially to a therapist yeah. if you're experiencing or want to learn skills to reduce burnout mm -hmm. but they will need very different approaches and Absolutely. understanding 
And a counsellor that's traditionally trained in person-centred counselling would probably try not to be the expert, so they wouldn't want to step in. They would be waiting for the client to be their own expert. But I think sometimes we don't recognise that difference, especially if we've not really educated ourselves yet or, or we just don't know this stuff. Um, you would just assume that a doctor's told you it's depression, therefore it's depression. But my counsellor certainly, it's still worthwhile me going to that counselling, but, but she will be more like helping me through, well, what, what work can you not do right now? you know it's <laughs> and I really don't want to step on your very very admirable profession of of counseling but for so for obviously when we're talking about these things that I would argue aren't mental health concerns mm -hmm. then I feel that and, and obviously general self-esteem and well-being as mm -hmm. well because it is very low for our community mm -hmm. um, but these sorts of things they are why we are Annette and I are trying to get um, large-scale research funding for our support program yeah. because that's where you could do that so and, and it, it's actually made me think when you were saying about when you discover you're autistic you go through those stages of grief almost mm -hmm. which is a bit of denial a bit of imposter syndrome mm -hmm. am I no I'm not you know no, no. can't be I'm not <laughs> like that small white boy with ear defenders um, <laughs> you know it's like yeah, no, I'm, yeah I'm, maybe I'm just making this all up you know the, it's the, yeah the anger because you look back and you go those people were mean to me and yeah. it's because I'm autistic actually and it's you know so you go through all these things yeah. but you do that on your own that's really mm. isolating yeah then you don't get necessarily or it takes some time or you might not ever learn that it's not depression it's burnout it's mm. not OCD it's repetitive patterns of behavior and actually they're quite healthy typically mm. we're not talking about harmful stims yeah. um you know and, and a number of other things the difficulties with elixithymia which a large mm. number of our community experience to some degree mm -hmm. um i argue is you you we see within our support program that happens that ability to have those conversations with a small group of other autistic people going mm. through similar things yeah and learning about those things mm -hmm. the, the multiple times I've, I've explained to a student who thinks or asks do you think I'm depressed and they sort of describe things and then I say I'm not dismissing that that's a possibility because I'm not yeah. a clinician mm -hmm. um but have you considered it's burnout and then yeah. they kind of go away they really look into it and then they come back and go I think it is what do yeah. I do and it's like right now I've got some practical things I can suggest mm -hmm. if it was depression go to the therapists who yeah. know what they're doing if it's you want some skills mm -hmm. to not get burnt out so often yeah um or just be kinder to yourself when you do experience burnout because we, yeah. yeah. um, we do yeah then we we can help okay we're still on the second question okay right um i just put like um it's like a funny thing with a question mark and an exclamation mark um what as you were thinking autistics can be counsellors <laughs> what we don't have empathy and oh, we yeah. can't communicate and yeah. it was a little sort of funny but would you like to discuss the stereotype that okay we uh this is why um and obviously i'm in the autistic counsellors type community um many of them don't come out because of that uh fear of not being taken seriously and those uh, stereotype assumptions that may be placed upon them and let's face it those possibly will be placed upon them if someone is not really well educated in this area which a lot of people are not <laughs> um, so yes and that is certainly a fear that I had to go through um, th there's nothing there's nothing wrong with my empathy skills um, but it's just that um, you know that stereotype and I might do it slightly differently as well you know my empathy maybe is more of a learned behavior than um, something I was born able to do in my t neurotype just would naturally form that actually I probably learned it from a different part of my brain but I can still do that um, and certainly in counselor training it, th those skills are honed in um, so I obviously I disagree that counsellors, autistic counsellors can't counsel, we absolutely can. Um, and I think for me, sometimes I, I maybe get less drawn into the emotion of, of it. So especially when with autistic clients, I think I'm a little bit, 
I, I don't obviously see lots of counsellors in, in practice, but my personal skill would be that I can stay in their frame of reference maybe more easily rather than it bringing me back to something within myself or my own experience and showing maybe more emotion there, Cause especially with autistic clients. We might, might, they might not especially like the counsellor who will suddenly start crying. You know, that, that could be quite alarming, but you no, know. No, no. <laughs> But that does, you know, that that is an expression of empathy sometimes in neurotypical kind of coupling. You know, the, the counsellor might cry uh, and, and that can have its uses that a counsellor's maybe seeing, is experiencing their sorrow or their grief and able to express that. You know, that, that has its place, um, especially in person-centred counselling. But for me, in my practice, it's my, it, I'm absolutely in the client's frame of reference. So I guess. And I think as an autistic person, I have had therapy, different therapies. Oh. I can't remember the th who I was discussing the very strange therapy that I had when I was about 17 or 18. And it was the most bizarre thing. And the person is a counsellor, yeah. another autistic counsellor. Mm -hmm. So what's make me come back to my first thought, which is about the weird therapies. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I, you know, I know another autistic counsellor. And, you know, so I feel I feel like it's quite sad. So when you're saying that, you know, there's a, a number of autistic counsellors that you might know who are concerned about being openly autistic as a counsellor. Yeah. And I think to some extent, they don't need to be concerned. They will be swamped with work. Oh, yeah, of course. Because yeah. the autistic counsellor friend that Harry and I know, mm. we, we purposely don't disclose who they are mm -hmm. because they try to manage their workload as an autistic person mm -hmm. as much as possible and if we made it known who they are they'd be swamped because yeah. there is a need for autistic counsellors mm -hmm. who know how to support autistic absolutely or, yeah. and I don't work in private counselling um, because I like to work in a place where I know I can manage how many clients I've got and I don't have to get involved in the marketing or anything like yeah. that um, but since qualifying i've had several job offers <laughs> yeah, um so um yeah there's an absolute need for for autistic counselors um, there's a yeah. de definite lack out there and um, so going back to your other question i just wanted to share something else with you um this disclosing this coming out that i am autistic and i'm a counselor kind of came when i was really starting to think about getting into more of the advocacy stuff and um, trying to improve counselling for um, autistic people by making sure more counsellors have that autism um, training. So I've, that's where I've gone. I've got a, 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 counsel, a Facebook group called Counsellors Working with Neurodivergence. So trying to get more counsellors in to be sharing that information with. Um, so I was just on the cusp of starting to go into those sorts of areas. Um, and I, I have two tutors who were my tutors at on my counseling course who were like my my mentors that that I really really look up to them um and we have we have what is now known as the the effort conversation <laughs> I'm not gonna say the word oh, okay. right. yeah okay. yeah um because I'd, I'd had this back and forward conversation with them like oh I, I want to tell people I want to make it known um but I'm really scared to um I don't want to be judged for it um Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, there was a lot of kind of um, self-evaluation in that and, and whether I was going to be brave enough. I was really scared about doing it. Um, and that it ended with that text. F it, I'm going to do it. And and then I <laughs> I put this Facebook post out and it, it was a bit of a damp squib, really, because <laughs> no one really, a couple of people commented, but I was expecting this big hurrah and it was... Yeah, not really. Um, but I had like a theme tune and everything, you know, this is me <laughs> from the musical. So for me, it was this massive occasion, this coming out. Uh, but yeah, it just it was fine. I've never been judged for it. If anything, it's made my career much better than it would have been because people are interested in, in me talking about it. And if I wasn't so open about it, they couldn't do that. With clients, though, um, I will only bring it up if it's relevant, because obviously as a counsellor, I'm there for their stuff. So I'm not there to go, this is all about me, blah, blah, blah. If it's relevant, I'll mention it. Um, so 
it's, it's like any kind of self-disclosure in counselling. It's got, you can do it as long as it's relevant and it, you think it'll help that client. So well, if you're working with the NHS or in the NHS? No, it's not the NHS. It's oh, okay. a, no, it's, it's, a, it's a college. Oh, okay. Um, but they're, if they're sending you people, do they, do they tend to send you the autistic people? Uh, yes. Um, it, it makes sense too that they've yeah. got me there and, and uh, that, uh, you know, they'll, think of me to, to send the autistic people to okay questions okay um <laughs> it's just because it's so easy to talk about this topic um <laughs> what is your neurodiversity reader um chapter about okay so it's about the efficacy of person-centered counseling for autistic people um so it um hadn't really been done before there was no literature review like this before um there was barely any literature on this um so I thought, right, well, well, this needs to be done. Um, so it looks at, it compares person-centered counseling to CBT to begin with, because most of the research is CBT based. So it kind of puts them together and, and, and compares them. Um, it then looks at what parts of person-centered counseling could be useful and are useful to autistic people. So these are things like the, the relationship the person-centered approach is heavily based on the relationship um, so to be able to counsel someone effectively you have to have been able to build a good relationship with them with that kind of trust um, and they also say another thing that's important is psychological contact is important to, for building relationships and that's somewhere where later on in the chapter i i look at that might not be done so easily we may struggle to form psychological contact with the counsellor. So there's a few. What does psychological contact mean? So that is just that connection between two human beings, okay. basically. So it's basically the relationship. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but the person that, that wrote about person-centred theory, uh, Carl Rogers, he said you can't really have the relationship without that psychological contact, that connection between the two people. Um, so, which I guess sounds obvious really when you hear the word relationship. Um, so um, another part of person-centered counseling is uh, three of the, the main core conditions, which are empathy, uh, congruence and unconditional positive regard. So um, obviously we know what empathy is. Um, congruence basically just means to be real so the counselor needs to be real and you take a client from being in a state of um i've lost my words <laughs> uh in a state of incongruence when the, when most people that come to counseling are in a state of incongruence they're not really attached to what their problems are um they're not maybe being their real self so generally speaking someone starts in an in incongruent state and by the end of counseling you're hoping that they are in a more congruent state so a counselor needs to be congruent to encourage that in the client um, so to be real and, and uh, the other one unconditional positive regard is to no matter what someone's done you're going to accept them positively. Now, if you think about all those core conditions, how many autistic people have experienced a relationship like that? You know, that person being real with them, that congruent person showing them empathy for who they are and giving them that unconditional positive regard and not trying to change them in some way to fit. So actually the person-centered approach is a very good one at its heart for an autistic person to experience that and particularly the unconditional positive regard as well mm. because how often are we when we're not with fellow autistic people mm. unconditionally positively regarded for who we are and accepted as we are yeah we're not um, are we? yeah especially growing up in school this is why we mask isn't it because because we are, we find when artistic traits are shown that they are, we are not accepted uh, positively. So it's something we learn not to do, that we're not going to be accepted that way. And then when we are masking, we're kind of probably misstepping still anyway. And we're still getting it wrong and still experiencing that, not UPR. Um, it's very conditioned to being an autistic person mm -hmm. in society. Um, and another part of person-centered counsel that works really well um, is its focus on something called conditions of worth. So conditions of worth are how you see 
yourself as worthwhile to be loved. So there will be conditions that you've learned or place on yourself as what, how you have to behave to be accepted and loved. And that is something for autistic people that we have a lot of conditions of worth because we have to fit into this neurotypical world. Um, so we tend to have more conditions of worth than the neurotypical person coming into counseling. So again, that's a massive part of person-centered counseling is working through those conditions. Um, Just trying to apply these things. I mean, I do teach very basic um, um, relating to Carl Rogers, et cetera, mm -hmm. for the access, access course that I teach for students. It's really not anywhere near as detailed, obviously. Um, and I'm just trying to, the thing that we do as autistic people, which to outsiders looks like we're making it about ourselves, but actually it's our way of connecting to mm -hmm. the things that have been discussed, just for Absolutely. those um, NTs potentially in the audience. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to connect it to the students potentially that I support. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, so what was the two, the, the, um, the self, you didn't say self-worth per se, did you? It was the conditions of worth. Conditions so, of yeah. worth mm -hmm. is really interesting because what we do tend to see is that the students do come to us where they don't seem to have ever experienced unconditional regard from anyone, really. Mm -hmm. um, and these conditions of worth are just, what would be the phrase where it's it's quite poor, where, where they have, is the idea that they've got um, extreme ideas of what they have to do or be to be worthy is that the idea that's basically what conditions worth means yes it's so you have a lot of conditions that have, that you place upon yourself um to make you worth worthy um i think i just said the same thing but, no no it's fine no, yeah, no, okay. it's fine. <laughs> yeah and that's fine um, if we yeah. just repeat it till it makes sense it's fine okay um, so my partner does that all the time like, no it, you just keep repeating it does not make it mean anything um, but no i was just thinking what's potentially interesting is I'm thinking that some of my the students that we support and it's quite it's so distressing to see is that they have this extreme ideas about and uh, conditions of how to be worthy yeah. but what's really interesting is in the space that we provide for them mm -hmm. that they are definitely getting unconditional mm -hmm. positive regard from mm -hmm. all the other members of the group yeah who it doesn't matter what that person does or sa says, mm. they are completely accepted. Yeah. So it's quite interesting. So I'm just hoping at some point that is the idea that you ha have to have all those things to change that condition of worth. So the empathy, the yeah, the, the, those core conditions. So that relationship, the empathy, congruence, the unconditional positive regard, are the the environment a counsellor creates people to be able to, to facilitate change yeah so we provide that environment and people can then access that and they then feel able to change so that's when it becomes the with that environment placed upon in the room the client then can feel comfortable and accepted to be able to explore themselves enough to change what they might want to change not what society tells them they should change so it's that and I guess that change might literally just be actually I like me exactly fine, as I am and that tends to be what that is that that's where we go from that being in a state of incongruence to a state of congruence it takes you back to who you really are so this uh kind of is it's called self-actualization um, yes I had to teach my students this recently <laughs> <laughs> um, on the access course different 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 role different hats yeah. um, so I'm also just listening just like Hmm. I, I feel like I might borrow this bit and I might borrow this. This is nice <laughs> yeah. for my students. Um, I feel like potentially that was, unless there's more to it in terms of, can you describe the practice of person centered counseling? That, that is the practice really. So, so basically it, Carl Rogers was very much a scientist. So he looks at uh, individuals as organisms. So an organism was born a certain way and it needs to be taken back to the way it was meant to really be. To be happy so that take that strips out all of the conditions of worth all those things that externally have been placed upon the person takes them away to who they really should be who they were really born to be their organism our, our truly authentic autistic selves it sounds exactly, like exactly exactly so 
I'll tell you about the potato now. I did promise you to tell, oh, yes, tell you okay. about the potato. So Carl Rogers, and it is really worth looking up this one, Carl Rogers potato. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna put it in my search bar so I do it, I look for it later. <laughs> Carry on. Okay, so I'm gonna describe my own journey now to the potato. So growing up um, as an autistic person um, and through various childhood things, I didn't have fertile soil to grow. Um, I um, didn't, I wasn't in an environment that could give me the, the, the kind of support I needed to be who I really could have been. Um, but a potato that is stored in a dark cupboard will sprout these spindly, uh, what would you call them? I can't remember what they're called, you know, bits. Roots, tubes. <laughs> Roots, yeah. yeah. It will try to grow. It will always be trying to grow, but it's very spindly. Um, so that I was very much that potato that was sort of in that dark cupboard. I, I got so far, but I was very spindly. <laughs> now, when I started my counselling course and I came across my mentors that, you know, they're very dear to me, um, and my husband as well, they provided this fertile soil. And so I could grow and flourish to be who I really should have been, who I really could have been and who I was born to be. So the potato sort of describes that. We all have um, a, a, a desire to grow. The, the, the organism will always have a desire to grow, but without the fertile soil, it won't be as flourishing as it can be. So that's what basically the, the person-centered approach is based upon this 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 natural urge to to be the best that you can be. And the, I had this discussion with with my access students, which oh. was about how some of the quite really beautiful and useful parts of pers the person-centered approach in general, not not just the uh, counseling approach per se, but the, the whole approach, oh. is that it talks about potential. Mm -hmm. And that people seem to have misconstrued that to mean ex expectations. Mm -hmm. So what you just described, mm -hmm. which is us being our best us, mm -hmm. and th that is our own personal potential. That does not yeah. mean, because you, you will potentially see it, potentially mm -hmm. see it, um, you know, um, parents who really are lovely really oh. love their children and mean well but they yeah. will say things like but I want them to meet their potential yeah but what they really mean is I want them to meet my expectations exactly which is to go to university to, yeah. to do xyz and those kinds of things and I feel oh. like that's a really sad thing that's been I I'm, I'm hope I'm not incorrect in saying that it, oh. that's been misconstrued from what oh. what didn't mean expectations that from outside it was no, your personal potential it's your internal self it actually the, the approach takes away the external expectations that ex, um it, it's designed to do that it's yeah. about finding out who you really are that congruent self which for me fits very very well with autistic people we haven't been we've been very much taught not to be our real selves and it's not just the person-centered approach you know most approaches most of the um writing in the very beginning about counselling practice is always about being the real self and you can't really be happy unless you are so a therapy that encourages people not to be their real selves might teach you just to ask better yeah um so that that's kind of what person-centered counselling tries and aims to do um so when I wrote the chapter that was kind of this is what really works about person-centered counseling for autistic people, but here is what doesn't work so well. So classic person-centered counseling doesn't really take into account that we may, ver verbal communication may not be our biggest, strongest point, whereas really in training, you're, it, it is a talking therapy um, and not really trained in other ways of working other than talking therapy so that's kind of a missing link um so if you were to sit down with um, a client and you would just maybe you'd, you'd maybe say an opening statement but sit there and expect them to just be able to talk you're going to fail pretty quickly <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so, I think that kind of expectation as well to just be able to talk, or even just being asked how mm. you feel, and particularly if you don't know how to process that mm. question, yeah, and or you don't know how to make your brain connect to your mouth and say mm. a response, yeah, and particularly if you also experience some form of elixithymia, which means mm. you don't know how to ex explain how you feel in the first place, yeah. there will be a lot of shutting down. Absolutely. And uh, we, we're trained in counselling to, to kind of be comfortable with silence. But I've had many clients say to me they're very uncomfortable with silence. So I will check in. I will be quite uh, direct in exploring what silence means to them and trying to trying to hone in on what's their uncomfortable face and what is them thinking and what is them having got to what they've wanted to say and are just there going i don't know what to say next <laughs> and not leaving people in that horrible uncomfortable space because again going back to our facial expressions we might not give it away quite so easily whether we are in a thinking place or we need like a light bulb above our head or something to like give a clue you know what I mean it's I look it, the same all the time it's yeah, really hard too. to know unless <laughs> I'm bawling my eyes out yeah which is not that common yeah. um to know that yeah. what I'm thinking or feeling um yeah. and, and and it does I can't remember what my original point earlier on was which I completely lost my train of thought anyway but like I said I've had multiple types of therapies and mm. tried to work on the things that I knew I needed to work on and, mm. and try to understand in terms of moving on and moving past certain things. Mm -hmm. um, the very bizarre therapy that I had that I tried to mention when, which I can't remember why, um, mm. when I was 17, it was, it was um, posed as though it was psychodynamic. Mm. I think if yeah. I remember rightly, I was quite young and um, it was the most bizarre thing. And when I was talking to this autistic counselor about it, she was like, that doesn't sound right it was the nhs it was yeah. at a hospital so it was like an outpatient's uh -huh. place that you went in and um by the time i finally got it i had to wait about six months um which i don't think is that bad for back then i don't compare to now i don't know um it was me talking to the therapist who i instantly didn't like because he dressed like a hippie and it really bo bothered me yeah. and i didn't like it and one way glass with two people on the other side who were writing notes whilst oh, I was talking to this. My thing. goodness. I didn't know I was autistic either at the time. Yeah. And then halfway through, they would come in, have a conversation about me, about what they'd learnt about me as if I was not there. Wow. It was the weirdest. Th I tried it for a long time. I'd never had therapy before. So I assumed this was just what happens. And after about a year, I thought, I've talked about this to death. Yeah. Nothing's changing. I need to go and just either decide that I'm going to let things go or not. And, mm -hmm. and that not everybody can do that. I know that. So that was just at that time. But the interesting thing where you were just saying about you've got a client um, in front of you and they're autistic and they don't make facial expressions. So how are you supposed to know mm -hmm. how they're feeling and how are they going to know? Yeah. While I was waiting for that very strange therapy for six months, two things, two, two quite important things. Mm -hmm. One Somebody came to visit me. I lived on my own at this point when I was 17. Um, came to visit me to check that I was okay while I was waiting for this thing. Now, I was in a really, really bad place. Probably the worst place I've been psychologically uh -huh. throughout my whole life. Uh -huh. And she thought I was fine. Wow. Now, that tells you everything yeah. about how I must have been masking. Uh -huh. Because I can tell you now without going into details, I was not fine. Yeah. So that was one thing. And then the other thing, which is, is very interesting about what you're saying about, we, don't, we can't just talk about no, it. No, we, we Talking therapy in and of itself is going to be a problem for it us. Is. Absolutely. And what that therapy, so-called therapy, mm. it didn't do anything for me. It didn't, you know, just talking, having a cry every week, every time I saw that person really yeah. wasn't helpful. I mean, knowing now that I'm autistic, it's probably because I actually needed some skills and to learn about yeah. burnout and things yeah. like that. And I don't mean social skills. So for everyone watching, we are not ever talking about teaching social skills no. to mask. We're talking about learning to cope and skills for burnout and so uh -huh. on. Yeah. And I saw somebody else in the interim and they were, I wish I'd had them because they asked questions. Yeah. 
they asked the right questions they looked through my file and I came in and they said how are you and I was like I am fine you know I'm all right and I thought I was and they asked a couple of really pertinent questions Mm. and that was what I needed I needed that and I know that now when I go to any therapy is that I actually need advice and guidance yeah and just talking is not going to do it for me no and you know a lot of what you do in counsel training is undoing what you learn in society about giving advice and asking questions that's part of the counseling but we need it sometimes you know and you know I, I in my own work you know sometimes it's more about that teaching than it is necessarily what their feelings are because they've spent a long time maybe not understanding autism or or, or I may have someone who just has found out they're autistic and they don't know all this stuff yet that you and I now know you know that stuff where where we were at the very beginning and all this stuff that's helped along the way you know sometimes I can impart some of that knowledge as part of the counseling like well actually that that's normal for an autistic person whereas it might not be normal for a neurotypical person so having that in-depth knowledge certainly helps in that room and knowing that you will need to ask questions as well um, despite the training that tells you not to ask questions um, yeah um we are likely to run over people in the audience are you okay to run over a little bit I, i'm okay to run over yeah okay if, if at any point you're like no no spoons left um just let me know i just i knew this is going to be too good a topic to just be able to do in an hour um okay back to the literature review yes. so how effective is person-centered counseling <laughs> okay so as I say, providing that environment is, is useful. We've obviously talked about that, why that's a good environment for an autistic person. What, uh, so it is effective in its, uh, in its initial design. What the gap is, is that we need to adapt it to fit the autistic person. So um, the autistic person needs a bit more help to be able to access that environment. So we still provide that environment with all those core conditions but they might need a little bit of help to to access them. So those are adaptations like maybe asking questions, um, learning the person's personal language. So that's a bit different to body language. Personal language is, you know, they might give something else away where we're talking about that face, you know, that it's what that language means to them. And that might be that we have to directly ask rather than just sitting there and trying to predict what it means actually directly asking um what are you thinking now you know which you're not trained to do really so again that's an adaptation um another thing i I know special interest isn't everyone's thing um but many of us do have a special interest so if you've got a client that does it can be really useful to know because if you find that the the client one week is um not not feeling too good and they're struggling verbally just by bringing up that special interest that can sometimes get them talking again and relax them to be able to talk again so you might talk about that for a bit and then they kind of can get back into what they need to talk about so that and can be I think that's actually quite lovely because mm. because we kind of do that naturally with our autistic peers yeah. or people you know again autistic students that I support is that they might never talk like we have students that attend our socials that never turn their audio on, never turn their camera on, never use the chat function. Mm-hmm. And that to us is participation. They come every week. So they're mm-hmm. getting something out of it. Yeah. Um, that's a whole other talk about the difference between autistic participation and non-autistic participation mm-hmm. in spaces. Um, but if you can find their specializations, mm. you, you can get something that, you wouldn't normally get from them so I think that's quite an important yeah I like and like you say if they're just just not able to orally articulate themselves that day Mm. if you give them something comfortable Mm. and and much more readily available isn't it it's more cognitively readily available to discuss yeah Um, I'm just thinking about what about stimming because that's something if I have students who come to me I'll because I noted in in your chapter, obviously you talking about the issues of, um, uh, you know, expecting eye contact, and so it would be important to tell the client you don't need to make eye contact. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, I, I think you don't also even need to bring it up mm. because you can set up the seating arrangement so that you're not yeah. looking at each other directly. I do that. Yeah, the, the yeah. seats are not like that. They're 
just yeah. to the side. And I tend to have a little pot of just objects yeah. um, so that I can fiddle with one, they can mm. fiddle with one, and then they know I'm not looking at them. Yeah. Like absolutely. they don't have to worry that I'm looking at them. And yeah. they also don't have to check because they're doing their own thing. So it's yeah. like different things that, yeah. You can I, think from the- I think it depends who you've got in the room I mean you may have a client who who feels quite negatively about being autistic and that they go a bit over the top with trying to keep up with the social expectations so they will be overly trying to do give that yeah. guy eye contact because they are coming in with conditions of worth they yeah. are coming in with this is how they've been accepted out in the outside society so to begin with they might not know that that's different within that room and so you you know I'm Again, everyone's an individual and you have to kind of do it sort of person by person. But sometimes you need to be a bit more direct about helping them with that incongruence and that you don't actually have to give me eye contact. Or it might, as you say, more happen more um, organically than that. It, it just, just, it's just something that a neurotypical counsellor needs to be aware of. They might assume that, um, that the not giving eye contact has a different meaning. Well, and like you said, the learning that person's language, which... Oh more generally speaking autistic people well unless they're like you say very heavily masking mm. to the extent that they actually make themselves more apparently autistic in that mask because you'll have the extreme where they because stimming is a thing for mm. to demonstrate that you're autistic yeah so it's a self-stimulatory behavior for people in the audience if they don't know which always sounds rude um but it's all human beings stim yeah. fidget move for Mm. all sorts of regulatory reasons i'm not teaching you don't worry um for regulatory reasons and autistic people tend to do it more often because we need Mm -hmm. to regulate more often um so because that's the scene as the autistic thing to do although all human beings do stim Mm -hmm. the ones that are trying to mask that much they become completely rigid and make themselves stand out more so because no human being doesn't fidget yeah that's true yeah um yeah, and, and some, again, autistic people that are masking, um, that they, they will stim in secret. And that, again, is another element of hiding themselves. So it, it's about being open in the room about everything like that. So, so having open conversations about stimming and not being afraid to bring up topics like that if you think that they're relevant. Um, yeah, because they're all important, aren't they? And, and obviously in the counselling room, you want them, if, if stimming is going to help them to relax, you don't want them not to do it. So, you know, and like, like, that, that, that person language thing is that, you know, we might note a certain type of movement and go, oh, that usually means anxiety for autistic people or all oh, that one. That means lots of energy or all oh, that one means they're really excited today. Yeah. You know, so we've got that ability to some extent because we know the language <clears throat> to be able to pick up on those things that maybe neurotypical people would either not understand or misconstrue as something that they should be really deeply worried about when actually exactly. it's not yeah exactly concern. yeah um yeah there is some difference that is helpful for us to know as, as counselors. i mean things like eating disorders um that we you know will quite often see present quite differently sometimes in autistic people to neurotypical people and um, sometimes it could be more about getting a certain number and they like to, to repetitively get to a certain number and that gets that kind of can get into the uh, into the, the disorder itself so it's it's kind of just knowing a few of the differences uh, but it's still, I mean supporting is still basically the same you, you support someone by being there for them and letting them explore it in the way that they need to explore it but as a counsellor it's, it's worth being able to pick out things like that I don't want to take, take up too much more time mm-hmm. is there anything else really about the effectiveness and what you found in your chapter that you'd like people to know um or ineffectiveness or barriers or well yeah another barrier i suppose is uh, to to obviously the obvious barrier of a counselor not being um trained uh, in autism that's obviously the biggest barrier um but things like actually getting to the counseling room so um knowing where to go knowing how to find an autistic counselor knowing that you can ask for an autist uh, or an, an autistic trained counselor i mean i wouldn't have i that may not have occurred to me if i'd not been on a training course um so and actually uh so so if you go through the gp you tend to just get 
through to the NHS, you know, the IAPT service who will just be not necessarily trained in autism. So it's actually when now, you, you know, once you know you're autistic, it's that, and I would like a counsellor trained in autism, please. That's a really important thing to ask for. I want, do, I mean, do you know how likely that, I mean, my understanding from looking into the literature is there's, there's not much, there's not much people, well, people aren't getting trained. Like I say, they don't have to be trained. No, there aren't many, there aren't many. So you're not gonna be spoiled for choice. Mm. Um, but if you look on the um, on one of the, the directories, the uh, what's it called, the counselling counselor directory, there are some things you can tick to say that the counsellor's got experience in certain things, and autism is one of the things you can tick. So there will be some out there, uh, but again, that's private counsellors. That might not happen if you go through the NHS, which is mm. the sad. But they they are very soon. They are going to be training all um, health care workers in the NHS in autism it's going to be a mandatory training thing that they do so hopefully in the future this won't be as it is now um, because that that legislation went through in 2019 and they're in the process of building that training so that, that, that Oliver McGowan yeah yes yeah. well yeah um, so you know we're, we're heading in the right direction but right now if you're trying to find a counsellor you are not going to be as spoilt for choice as a neurotypical person is um, which is another point I'd like to make, actually. I obviously looked at CBT and person-centered counseling in this um, because CBT seemed to be a panacea for autism. So it was the only one really that was offered. And I, I'm not saying that person-centered should be the only one offered. What I'm saying is we should have as much choice as option. neurotypical yeah. people have. I'm a person-centered counselor, so I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna know more about that and I'm gonna know what's gonna work, what's not gonna work. But we need more research in all of the approaches. We should all have this training. I think that probably most approaches would be able to work for an autistic person as long as the counsellor has the training yeah. and isn't trying to change the person to neurotypical um, expectations. Or uh, And that's one huge thing that I did note in the review. That It's not the review in the sense that you were doing. Mine was to actually teach uh, a lecture and... Um, and now I deliver it as training mm -hmm. um, about CBT, its effectiveness, its ineffectiveness and all mm -hmm. that kind of thing is what there's not that much literature mm -hmm. on. There's lots of literature on CBT. Yeah. There's next to none on it being adapted for autistic people. Mm -hmm. And where there is literature on that, their outcome measures are not what we want. They're not on well-being. They're on social skills training. Yeah. And things like that. Yeah. Um, and this is why, like I say, I actually started that lecture or delivering that lecture is because it was a lovely essay question for university students. Yeah. And the question was, discuss the efficacy of a talking therapy for autistic people's well-being. Mm -hmm. And the majority of them focused on social skills training, yeah. CBT. And I said, you have not answered the question. No. We're not asking about making autistic people non-autistic because you can't. No. You're just going to make a very traumaed masked autistic what yeah. we're talking about is well-being yes. and to try and get people to understand that is quite i don't understand how it's so difficult for <laughs> non-autistic people to understand no. that there's a difference yeah especially as as i said before all of these main therapies at their core are people being authentic their authentic selves it seems like that doesn't count for us <laughs> it's very you know it's very distressing i yeah. I'd say when i was having to mark the essays the first time before I actually had the opportunity to deliver a lecture to make sure that didn't happen again mm. I was getting quite distressed I was like I don't want to have to read 30 essays that tell me I need to change that yeah. tell me I'm a deficit and a disorder and mm. and all these quite you know and it's not it wasn't the students fault it was what they were reading yeah yeah in the literature and the literature is a problem because the research is a problem yeah. because they have the wrong outcome ideas and like yeah. I say I think we discussed this before but the issue was they were at one stage the essay was about picking two populations mm -hmm. and discussing the efficacy of a talking therapy and they had mm -hmm. to pick one they most of them pick CBT mm -hmm. and they compared autistic population and a dementia population mm -hmm. at one point and when you think about it there's some similarities in the sense of we have so-called challenging behavior in quotation marks as do sometimes 
people who experience dementia Mm -hmm. and so they and um difficulties understanding our emotions and Mm -hmm. and things like this there were some similarities when they were describing the two populations Mm -hmm. they were much more humanizing Mm -hmm. rightly yeah of those dementia patient population Mm -hmm. but talking about autistic children Mm -hmm. incredibly dehumanizing and it's what they were reading it was the research that's there so obviously we need people with like yourselves doing your phd um and and talking about it um and producing new literature that demonstrates what actually is needed and yeah and actions that are needed yeah i'm very into the uh, nothing about us without us slogan um and you know my i'll be looking for participants soon but you know that's kind of i bring that into the into my kind of uh, participant information sheet is that the whole team will be autistic so i'm autistic and they will be autistic we're all autistic doing this so i don't know very many neurotypical people now and if i do i don't really talk to them so not not in a rude way just in you know on the daily basis the people i talk to are autistic yeah Um, so yeah easier to make teams with just autistic people now which is lovely absolutely okay um we're gonna to have to speed through the last one okay. i apologize um it, I, I just thought this is going to be too interesting um very quickly i just saw callum brazo it, it just asking is this research available on dementia and autistic people it was a essay question and they were looking at lots of literature to try and put an answer to that essay question so it's not a set piece of research where they were comparing the two groups just to be clear um so i've got here Ask about the article Lisa created with her son, Harry. Okay. Not Harry Thompson, different no. Harry. <laughs> different Harry, Harry Cromer. Um, right, so my my son, um, as I said, I, I, I attribute him to me finding out I'm autistic, so I'll always be so grateful to him for that. Um, but he had some, some, some sort of trouble grow, growing up um, through mainstream school. So in primary school, he picked up um, a sensory issue to music because bully bullies picked up he had like a sensory issue around noise and started playing music at him so his brain kind of linked those two things together and from about the age of I don't know seven I think he couldn't listen to any music ever (laughs) so that was quite um it was debilitating for him and it was kind of debilitating for the whole family really so i've got two other children so if there was a film on they'd they'd have to turn it off if he came into the room and if i was watching a film with harry he'd if any music came on which in films obviously is regularly we'd have to mute the telly until the music had gone it it affected everything so going to like play barns and mcdonald's for a while we actually had to ask them to turn the music off whilst we were there Um, but it's not always you can't always do that. So if you're in a supermarket and there's music playing, you couldn't do that. Um, firework displays drove me mad when they started all of a sudden having music played because then he couldn't he couldn't go to firework displays, which was something he did enjoy. Anyway, so there was that issue growing up um, that was really stopping his life. It got in the way of school as well because obviously he couldn't do music lessons or if there was there's music everywhere. Uh, um, so he, he, he started off um, at a mainstream high school with an autism kind of uh, unit attached to it, um, where he was supposed to do new mainstream lessons and go, go for breaks in the unit when he needed a break. But it just ended up that he spent all his time in the autism unit. He was missing quite a lot of lessons. Over time, that's what happened. And he developed this really bad back. And I always suspected that there was more to this back than just being a bad back, um, you know, that's like a somatic. Um, now, then lockdown happened. Um, and all of a sudden, two weeks later, this bad back that had been going on for six months, he was he had physio for it. We had a special parking badge so he didn't have to walk very far, disappeared two weeks into lockdown. And me and him got talking about that Um I mean, I'd, I'd said to him previously, was it, is, are you stressed? Is this anxiety? Are you, you know, talk about it. Um, but he wasn't putting those two things together. I'd also mentioned about the music thing, you know, that there might be a link. Um, and, um, but that never really had sunk in. He didn't see that himself. So he came up creatively um, in his own mind with this image of uh, like a, like a, um, 
stump of a tree with these roots coming off of it. So, and these roots of his were all really, really tangled to each other. Um, so, so autism would have been one of the roots, sensory issues, music, bullying, high school, uh, bad back, pain, and they were all really, really tightly wound up together. And he managed in his mind to untangle the roots. He realized, because he could do it visually, he realized that actually, yes, that bullying was related to the music. So when he started talking about this idea, I said, well, Harry, you need to draw this, you know, because quite often he will have, he will visualize it in his mind and he will just then be able to describe it. I said, you need to get this on paper because as a counselor, I often work with autistic people using creative interventions because that gets around the verbal, um, you know, not, not, not always being able to do the talking therapy through verbalization. Creativity sometimes really helps that. I said, you need to do that. So we went, we got up at like four in the morning, went to our local forest. We thought, right, no one would be there then. We want to film this thing. It was summer, so it would have been light. And I had him just draw this image and talk through this image. And he spent about half an hour in this process. And he just, it was just the most amazing thing to, to hear him describe um, and able then to get in touch with some of this feeling and emotion and these things being linked. And then it just, it literally did that. It untangled this stuff. So uh, I think two days later, I took him to, I, I took him in the car. We were going to go and do another film um, at a beach. Um, and we had music on in the car. Now, the, the first time we put it on, he kind of jumped. But that was that. We, we had this music on in the car. And now, and he, he now has like a favorite band, um, George Ezra. Uh, he's got a song that talks about anxiety. And that's the song. The lyrics to that song are what describe how he felt and, and, and what he came out. Listen to that song. Um, because that describes how he, his whole experience, that he is now free from this, um, to be able to listen to it. So we, we kind of bought him a gift. We got him some of those posh, like, AirPods, you know, those iPod, iPad, iPhone things. Um, and now he, you know, listens to music all the time. Talking about a child here that went from seven to nearly 15 with this terrible, debilitating music thing, to go from that, to listening to music all the time, really loudly as well, just because he managed to find that way to unpick some of this stuff. Um, so basically, I then wrote an article about it. So I took all the subjects that he touched on in this uh, talk. So there's bullying, there's psychosomatic pain, which is more common in children who uh, are who don't have peer support. So that's more common. But again, it's another one of these massively under-researched areas. Uh, looked at memory, so being in a, high, a mainstream high school and the way they're taught is not necessarily how the autistic brain best learns. I found out that there's a part of the, the autistic memory that is completely uniquely involved in intelligence, whereas neurotypical people aren't, so it's, it's completely new, 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 unique to us. And if they could just tap into that, rather than when you read an EHCP, uh, of your child who is in mainstream school. It's all about how to make them fit better into that mainstream school, how to not be themselves <laughs> again. Um, so uh, what else did the article talk about? So it talked about anxiety in general. It also talked about, we did a survey of how many other autistic uh, children in mainstream school um, had their anxiety actually lessen due to lockdown and we found 65 percent had a drop in their anxiety levels uh, as he did obviously um so there's a major issue so that led me to look at well how did we get to inclusion what was meant to be in inclusion for it to work is that being done absolutely not <laughs> um so the, in 1978 they had this big meeting about you know inclusion basically moving pe autistic people into mainstream schools the things they said that that would need to happen was for all teachers to have autistic training and um and there to be money <laughs> put into in 1978 it. in 1978 um the, the person baroness warnock 
I think was in charge of that meeting. Um, and those were the outcome, this big kind of government paid for study. That was what was needed for it to work. They did it without those two things. Um, so now when you read anything by this, this Baroness Warnock, who was like the main driver of this, she says it was an abject failure. Those things haven't happened we need to go back to not back to how it was because it was wrong the way it was autistic people were were put into this place where we were, were not thought of to be able to do anything that's not right but inclusion hasn't worked either uh, not and in its harry, current harry tends to describe it as false inclusion because it's it's yes. not inclusion at all like you say it, it's inclusion is not trying to make that person fit into mm -hmm. something they can't fit into that's exactly. false inclusion it is yeah is it inclusion is not just putting two people in the same building it's making sure they can access it in a way that doesn't make them get bullied autistic children are bullied twice as much as autistic as, as neurotypical people and that leads to this psychosomatic type problems um yeah anyway so so this this talk led to this research paper um and we are passionate about getting it out there we, we spoke at the very beginning about the nightmare of trying to get something published um and i'm I, i've kind of had to ha have a little break from that because um i was finding it quite draining um i just i just if i just put it off i should really yeah. try and publish something it's just so much yeah. easier to just get asked to do a chapter in a book it is so Fine. much easier have have, have my chapter <laughs> yeah. no it still takes me ages to do that but at least there's the you know it's it just doesn't sound as draining oh. as the which is not disabled it's not disability accessible oh it's terrible and, and and i've tried to get it into two two journals they've i've had to redesign it for both of them with these like pages and pages long criteria trying mm -hmm. to decipher what they mean because it's so vague and i've just is there I've a done... particular type of journal that you're hoping to publish it in or you just want it published and accessible i just want it published and accessible because then okay, i can share it myself oh, okay yeah okay. um but this article and, and doing this project together has boosted his self-esteem so i mean to, to go back a step he has now moved out of mainstream education as has my youngest son and i'm desperate to get my daughter out of there as well um but, but they've both gone to these absolutely beautiful schools um that are mental health schools where the predominantly are autistic people in there and they're just so individual and so harry now wants to go into psychology um he wants to get behind me with the advocacy stuff um so we want to be a bit of a team really the neuroticians he wants us to be called um so that's where we want to go and to see him know what he wants to do is, is unbelievable and to have this drive and this passion for something you know, before that, you ask him what do you want to do when you're, oh, I don't know, you know, it, but he's got this real drive now. And his school that he's at, some are really getting behind it as well. So they use it, it when they're talking to him, his article, they've read it, they've been really supportive of it. Um, and they, they will help him get into psychology. Which is lovely. Yeah. I just, because I, I mean, it would be nice to stop there, actually, because it's a nice ending. But the only thing I'm thinking about is again, when I think about the people I'm supporting, mm. is how lovely Harry's, your Harry, mm -hmm. um, work is that he's created, you know, and I'm just thinking how might we support those who don't have that level of introspection and investigation, mm. but yeah. also importantly, who have aphantasia, because I have a, a, a small number of students who, it seems quite, um, it seems like a correlation where they have aph aphantasia so they don't visualize they don't mm -hmm. think in pictures which mm -hmm. i can't understand because that's <laughs> how my brain works it's yeah. why i can't look at people because i have to imagine the pictures yeah um of of how my brain's mm. depicting whatever it is i'm talking about mm -hmm. and so i see this link between aphantasia so the inability to visualize or think in mm. pictures yeah um and elixithymia mm -hmm. which is quite interesting so there seems to uh, it's a very small anecdotal number of people mm -hmm. so i'm just thinking potentially how that might work as a process with somebody like that or would we look into something else in terms of a creative practice to I try and help i don't know who, about the people you're talking about but maybe um looking at the body and body type signals so what physically something feels like so interoception yeah um so teaching again this is psychoeducation rather than 
counseling per se, but it's uh, okay when you're feeling, when you set, maybe say, say someone is, is getting very angry very quickly and doesn't know why. Um, so they may be having meltdowns far too regularly um, or, or at all and, 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 and getting obviously the, the horrible draining effect of a meltdown. Trying to teach a bit earlier on how their body may have been feeling so they may notice that they kind of shake their foot in the run up to this meltdown or, or, or explosion or whatever it is they experience that they find distressing or that maybe they, it leads to self-harm. Um, you know, maybe that's the point, the point of exposure, or it, sometimes it, it's internally done as well, isn't it? That yeah. damaging place you go. It's that I've got, um, I, I sent it to you, didn't I? Um, a list of, a, a booklet of creative counselling ideas. One of them is like a barometer. Is that shareable, that one? Yes. I think I sent you a link to it. It's on my website. If it's in, sorry, just quickly i'm just gonna have a double check because otherwise i'll i'll hunt for it so that they've got it I, you sent me a lovely list of things which i think will be really useful for people um i have things that you gave me that i've put in the description okay. for the live like the creative counselors club mm -hmm. counseling tutor would it would it be within that or would i need to um i, th I think it's called the, the uh, creative counseling ideas for autistic people is the file name i ah. think I think yeah. I've got something, Lisa Cro it's a link here on the yeah. description. Yeah. Um, Lisa Cromar, blah, 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 blah. Creative counseling ideas, autism, PDF. That's the one. Right, okay, yeah. two seconds. Lovely okay. people of all Academy. Um, I don't know how many of you ever bothered to look at our descriptions, but in the description, there are lots of fantastic links that Lisa has um, provided us. So the one, so this creative toolkit that you're mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. um, is part of that list so yeah. please have a look at those um because you'll probably will find those useful sorry that's okay no that's fine um so the barometer task that's in there kind of talks about um so at the very big at the bottom it, it gets you to sort of start thinking about what does calm feel like for you you in a, your most happy place how's your breathing doing um how what does your face kind of look like um are you not sweating you know gets you to really think about it the next stage up is that you're kind of you're not calm but you know you're just kind of not all right you're not massively suffering but you're not quite calm what does that look like you know do you start getting some intrusive thoughts do you do you start i don't know maybe that's when maybe you go to a um a stim um or it could be that you sort of like feel your heart racing a bit or you're a bit sweaty. There'll be, everyone will have, going back to personal language, everyone's body will have these clues. And then it goes up. It keeps going up in stages. Do you ever use those um, circular, where it will say bodily experiences and then it tries to connect possible emotions? I haven't, but that sounds really useful. Yeah, I'm just... Um, I think Sai, who's in the comment section, I know you found one. If you're there, would you mind posting it for the learners as well? Mm. Um, again, I'm um, personal, um, uh, selfish reasons. I'm thinking of the students that I've supported that mm. do have quite extreme elixithymia. I did have mm. one lovely student who didn't know he was smiling. So it was yeah. so extreme, he didn't really even recognize physical yeah. states yeah. changing. But we did work out that although he couldn't describe or articulate or feel mm. according to him obviously I don't know how his body felt to him but mm -hmm. that's how he described it um so although he didn't think that he felt emotions mm. he could understand if he was distressed so, yeah. so we had to work on well what's the language that you can use mm -hmm. um, and we did get to a point where it was like as long as you're not distressed mm -hmm. that you're not feeling these emotions yeah okay you know because um but we did also try to some extent not as in anywhere near as much detail or as thorough as it sounds that you would potentially address it oh. which was to try and work on what his physical body mm. was doing so mm. we talked about getting um like a fitbit watch thing so he could recognize when his heart rate changed and things yeah. like that just yeah. to start trying to pay attention to his body yeah but those are particularly difficult people to try because you can't use the language of how do you feel today no, no. how are you feeling because they they will say they don't know and then they feel frustrated that they can't tell you oh no and it's, that like, feels... it's okay yeah 
you don't yeah. if you you know as long as you we, we need to just work out what is distress mm -hmm. language then yeah. if we can't work on emotion yeah. um gone off on a complete tangent again like i say just being selfish and thinking of um, um how it might apply to people that i might be able to support as well um any final thoughts on i mean anything that we've discussed or anything you want to finish up about talking in terms of your son who sounds great um yeah i think that it would be it would be good to get him on here yes and, and have a chat um, as I say I think that it'd be good to for him and his, his self-confidence um, and he's got a lot to share because he's a 15 year old boy and we don't often hear how it is for an adolescent autistic boy um, but he is quite good at talking if you get him on the right subject and he's I very... didn't want to mention it until you did so I didn't want to like put it out there but um so is that okay to yeah, mention yes fine, are... yeah. okay so we are very much hoping um and and Harry Cromer is very interested in doing a pre-record. We wouldn't do it as a live, but doing a pre-record where we discuss his article and his idea of. Is there a, a term that you've come up with? Yeah. You've come up with for his the, the article, the stump. Uh, yeah, the roots of the autistic mind. Lovely. So yeah, mine's just the stump, but <laughs> the roots of the autistic mind. So yes, yeah. we are very. Um, hopeful that we will be arranging in the new year to do mm -hmm. a lovely um, pre-record session with Harry Cromer mm -hmm. on the roots of the autistic mind mm -hmm. which I think will be great yeah um, so watch this space that'd be great um, yeah any final final um, I just say about that creative counselling booklet people might find the idea that's quite near the end of the booklet um, quite useful because it's it incorporates spoon theory and masking so it's all about how to avoid burnout by masking um, so it's um there's some pictures you can cut out and kind of laminate I mean who doesn't love laminating <laughs> I should have a laminator I'd be are you would you be one of those people that um <laughs> sorry i was just harry's being harry in the comment section um my harry not your harry yeah. harry thompson um oh no i've lost my train of thought harry sorry what what were you saying oh it's okay it's i've used it a few times now and people have found it really useful to know how many spoons how much energy they're using in that everyday masking that they're doing we don't I think just about wanted it you to clarify because it sounded like you said to reduce burnout by masking but I think do you oh, mean no. the masking is the thing that that is causing the burnout exactly yes. yeah okay. so this this is like a task to sit down and actually address all the places that you mask and how much energy that's taking on a daily basis and how some ideas of how you could avoid some of that and save some of those spoons which ones are necessary and which ones are not necessary I know because you sent me all these lovely things I need to have a decent decent look at that then because the thing we struggle when we do our support program one of the sessions is on specifically on masking and then we we introduce that not until session three mm -hmm. because a lot of our students are late discovered mm -hmm. um a small number of them have been diagnosed when they were children and yeah. another smaller number of um, diagnosed later and some of them are waiting for assessment this kind of thing mm -hmm. um and to get them to try and understand what is the mask or what is their what is their masking behavior is actually quite difficult yeah it is yeah to get them to go well which bit yeah what, what is it that i do um and sometimes it's just as um straightforward as saying i, I think one of our students who was a mum mm -hmm. um late diagnosed and she gave the example of i went to a teacher's meeting and the lights were horrible, mm -hmm. but instead of asking them to turn them off or even putting on my sunglasses, I sat there and suffered yeah. and got really bad headache because they didn't want to stand out. They didn't yeah. want to put their sunglasses on and be seen as odd to, for wearing their sunglasses indoors, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And then people just go, that's masking. It's like, yes, because yes. you're putting your needs, you're, you're, you're masking your needs and yeah. you're authenticity as well exactly yeah so so what i do in the task is i get them to either draw or have a photo of them as a child and them as an adult because i think it's good to take the child and actually identify the, the kind of more raw autistic traits that they've learned to mask and once you've got a good idea of what yours are i mean my, one of mine is i can't stand people eating 
you know and as a child that probably would have resulted in in, in you know an outward expression whereas now i sit and just get irritated or you know i know that then uses a spoon because i'm not letting on that that's hard so it's I, it's I find it easier to do by looking at as a child those sort of those like i say more raw traits and then compare as an adult you usually find they don't change do they you just learn to mask them yeah so i think the difficulty i have because i some of the training i've got different trainings but one of them or some of them I might just incorporate it if it's asked is the growing I do a bit on growing up autistic because I didn't know I was autistic yeah but when I look back I'm like how did they not spot that I know like, look at all the signs yeah. but to a large extent I also look at pictures of me in the past and go oh I'm masking there mm. and I'm only six or seven yeah it's quite difficult because but then there are some there's some things where I'm quite clearly observably autistic and I, yeah. it's kind of like how did well I know why I didn't get there was there was other things going on in the world in our life that meant that people didn't pick it up as um, unusual in the sense of not being typical neurotypical yeah I'm I'm losing my ability to get my words out now Um, so that might be a good place to to stop but there's lots of lovely um, links there for people and people seem really pleased I'm sorry I haven't looked um, or replied or asked even if you've had any questions for Lisa um, because we've gone over and the thing I was laughing at was Harry who said where was it that made me laugh oh they're all off they're they're all going too much in the comments okay Um, and at some point they're all talking about very strange things I said this happens sometimes and then there's some really great comments mixed in so um, Harry says as Academy can you wrap it up already no Academy video exceeds one and a half hours this is virtual loitering <laughs> so he has this thing about loitering it, it re- uh, he does not like loitering yeah. at all um, yeah so lots of you're welcome if you ever get back on social media to have a look at the comments um, there's some really nice ones people explaining how um, useful the talk is um, and that they're going to go look at the um, the links and things like that that we've sent them and then there's also our regulars who are being silly with each other so feel (laughs) free to just skip those and just look at the the others Um, but yes thank you so much Um, this has been really really useful I'm going to go and have my dinner yeah oh wow that's late (laughs) well yeah I can't I can't have it before it's it's weird um but yes so thank you everybody this has been Academy, and we have had lisa cromar talking about person-centered counseling and among a million other things that i think we've talked about <laughs> so see everybody next week when we have a very another very exciting um live we have nick walker who wrote what i deem the definitive definitions of neurodiversity the paradigm the movement the narrative Um, So we have Nick Walker on and we're going to discuss neurodiversity and what she's up to now and it's going to be lovely just before Christmas. So thank you everybody and we will see you next week. She says trying to find the end button.